Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, the webinar will take about an hour. Um, I'm going to show you how to do handwriting recognition, so a form of OCR, um, in Python, using Python code and TensorFlow. Um, and um, there'll be an opportunity for a quick Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, there's a chat function in Zoom. Um, just type them in the chat window um, and um, send the chat to everyone or send it directly to me, it doesn't matter. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, I'll go through uh, the questions and I'll answer them one by one. Um, also, make sure that you mute your microphone uh, because I can hear some background noise and it's easier for me to talk if everything's quiet. So uh, make sure that you mute it um, so that uh, everybody else has no problem uh, understanding what I'm saying. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so a month ago, I did a very similar webinar. So one month ago, I gave a webinar on machine learning in C Sharp with .NET. Um, so that was very cool. So I showed uh, a bit of machine learning, I showed a few apps uh, using the Accords library in uh, C Sharp. And um, well, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then something very interesting happened. I got a phone call um, from a training institute in Kuala Lumpur, and they wanted to hire me as a machine learning trainer. Uh, so they sent me their curriculum. Um, and um, it was nothing I couldn't handle, so it looked interesting. But all the courses were in Python and TensorFlow. So, and they asked me, Are you, uh, do you have experience with this platform? And then, so I told them, yeah, look, I'm a .NET developer, um, I specialize in C Sharp, so I can, I can give all those courses, no problem, I get the theory, um, but I do C Sharp and Accords, and my Python is a bit rusty. And while I was talking, I was listening to myself and thinking, wow, that sounds totally lame. Um, that's not the right answer. If someone wants to hire you for a job and they say, you know, do you master these, these technologies? The answer is, yeah, sure, let's do it. So I thought, I realized that if you want to move into machine learning, regardless if you are a C -sharp .NET developer or not, you're gonna have to master Python and TensorFlow um, only because these are the most popular uh, this is the most popular language and library in the machine learning community. Um, if you're in a job interview and, I don't know, like it's a promotion or you're switching jobs and you're going to do something with machine learning, like a developer or lead dev or architect position, and they ask you, okay, so it's all in Python, and we're using TensorFlow for rapid prototyping, um, is that okay? Then, of course, your answer has to be, yeah, sure, no problem, let's do this. So I decided to create a new course which is again an introduction into machine learning. So it basically covers the same theory as um, my previous C Sharp course, but all the code, all the code examples are in Python and they all use TensorFlow. And again, it's all done in Visual Studio. So if you're a .NET developer and you're used to Visual Studio community, uh, you can just use that to code in Python, no problem. But all the code is in Python. And all the, um, uh, all the examples use TensorFlow. So this is quite cool. If you are a .NET developer, and um, like you've done my first course on C Sharp, you could you can actually do this one. And since the theory is the same, you already know that part. And you can just look at the code examples and compare them to C Sharp. So you've got the C Sharp and Python side by side. And that is a super fast way to learn Python. In fact, that's how I learned Python. Um, I did a number of machine learning courses myself in Python, and then I translated the code to C Sharp so I could put it in one of my courses. Um, so that's basically how I learned the language. So this is the same thing in reverse. You already know C Sharp. Um, you could do a Python course on top of that, and then you can very quickly learn Python and TensorFlow. Now, in this course, one of the exercises is to do handwriting recognition. And what I'm going to show you in this webinar is that specific code example. So we're going to do handwriting recognition using Python. Um, we're going to use a deep neural network, a neural network with two hidden layers. And we're going to use TensorFlow and Python codes to train the neural network and to use it to make actual predictions. And then I have this little C-sharp application uh, where I can test the handwriting recognition. So I can do some scribbles 
and then it'll call into Python and uh, do the prediction using the neural net. So I'll show you how that works. So um, that's basically my introduction. So let's get started with the content. Um, so again, if you have any questions um, while I'm talking, um, just type them in the chat, and then afterwards we can go through them one by one. If you have to leave um, early, or if I'm talking too fast, or I go over some codes and you want to slow it down and want to look at it again in your own time, I'm recording this webinar. So it's, it's uh, recording as we speak on my laptop. And when it's done, I'll upload the recording in the uh, C-Sharp Architects Facebook group, so you can watch it there. And it will go on uh, my website. Uh, so on those two places, you can look at the video of the webinar and watch it again in your own time, or watch it if you have to, if you have to run out for whatever reason. OK, so let's get started. So uh, machine learning in Python with TensorFlow. So first off, um, first off, um, what is machine learning? So you might already know this, but uh, for those of you who are new to machine learning, so machine learning is a really cool um, specialization of IT, basically specialization of development, where you write code that trains itself. It's, uh, the computer learns skills by itself. Um, so it, it's a pretty cool um, domain to work in. Um, you might have uh, heard of um, AlphaGo, uh, Google's application, Google software that beat the grandmaster Lee Sedol at, the, at Go, at the game of Go. Um, th the way they did it is they just built this huge neural network and they uh, let it play Go and it played against itself. So they just had two or three or four instances of the same app playing against itself and every time at the end of the match, the winner would move forward. So the winner would move to uh, another game playing against another app that would have won the previous round. So basically, this was just a way to train a neural network and make it smarter and smarter. And the, the software figured out the rules of Go um, as it went along. So nobody told it what the rules were. Nobody told it what the good Go strategy is. Um, they only taught the software how to um, how to determine if a game was won or lost, basically. And the software figured out everything else on its own. So machine learning is really cool. It's basically you throw a bunch of data at a piece of software and it figures out the patterns and correlations on its own. Uh, it learns from experience. And so the cool thing is the software can deal with entirely new situations. It can handle situations that have not been explicitly programmed in in there in advance. And it, it, machine learning is this huge popular field right now. It's, it's literally exploding onto the market everywhere. Um, people are just using these machine learning libraries like TensorFlow to, to do all kinds of stuff. Um, I was at a presentation yesterday um, of Facebook marketeers. So it was about Facebook advertising. And somebody demoed an app that um, it basically takes a video recorded in landscape and it crops it to portrait. So it basically just, you know, it's a, so it takes this land, landscape aspect ratio and it, it crops it into a portrait aspect ratio. And of course, you lose a lot of video in that process. So it automatically zooms in on the interesting part of the video. So they had this, this video of a skier skiing downhill on a mountain. And the, the machine learning software figured out on its own that the skier was the, the interesting part of the video and the mountain was a bit boring. It zoomed in on the skier, and then it cropped the video in portrait around the skier, and it would constantly follow the skier as it zigzagged through the frame going down. So this is a beautiful implementation of machine learning, automatically editing a video without human intervention. And uh, people are inventing all kinds of cool stuff. So anyway, in summary, machine learning is super cool. So if you want to use machine learning, um, Python and TensorFlow are the way to go. Um, and the reason for that is that um, everybody's using it. So uh, you gotta, you got to master that language and that library. But it's also good to see what's out there. Um, there are a number of competing libraries. Uh, like, for example, Microsoft has its own machine learning la uh, library called CNTK, the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, CNTK. And it's basically a competitor to TensorFlow. It's Microsoft's TensorFlow. It has a different API, it's slightly faster, it, it interfaces with C-sharp, uh, TensorFlow can't do that. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to see what's out there, what libraries are out there, how do they work, um, how do people use these libraries in the field. It gives you a broader understanding of the uh, state of play. So secondly, um, knowing Python and TensorFlow helps you ace a job interview. Um, nine times out of ten, a job interviewer is going to ask you, um, can you do Python, can you do TensorFlow, can you do machine learning, and now you can say yes. Um, it's probably what you're going to encounter. Uh, basically, any uh, startup doing anything with machine learning or AI uses Python and TensorFlow, so uh, it's good to master this. It's the most popular machine learning library, and Python is the most popular language in the field of data science. Now, there are disadvantages. Uh, Python and TensorFlow are slow. Um, I, I did the C Sharp course, um, I did this, the same webinar a month ago with C Sharp, and the exact same code is, is mm, I'd say, twice as fast in C Sharp than it is in Python. Um, now, the reason for this is, of course, I'm running everything in a virtual machine. Um, I don't have a GPU, so uh, I'm using TensorFlow using CPU instructions and not GPU instructions, and it's virtualized hardware, so it's basically the worst case scenario. But I have to say, I used C Sharp in that exact same scenario, and C Sharp was a lot faster. So Python does tend to be a bit slow. Um, the TensorFlow API is also a bit clunky. Um, I'm, I'm not too happy with it after I've seen CNTK. Uh, CNTK uses a pipeline metaphor. So basically you throw data into a pipeline, you configure pipeline stages, and at the end of the pipeline is a neural net that gets trained. And that, that's a very nice metaphor to, um, to visualize data processing. Um, TensorFlow uses an input function, uh, which is it's kind of the same thing, but it's, it feels a bit clunky to me. And um, finally, um, if you are active in enterprise software development, um, you're going to be working with C Sharp and Java a lot. And Python doesn't play well with C Sharp and Java. There's no direct link between those two languages. So to take data from a C Sharp application in an enterprise domain and get it into a Python app, um, you, go, you have to jump through a few hoops. I'll show you how I did it in the, the app I'm going to show you. Um, but uh, there's no um, direct link where you can just link the two together. Um, there is a, a .NET flavor of Python called Iron Python, and if you create an Iron Python application, you just have an assembly, and of course you could link that into a C Sharp application, no problem, but TensorFlow doesn't work well with Iron Python. So for this webinar, I didn't even try. Um, I read on Google that it's, it's, it's very uh, flaky and it doesn't really work. So I used classic Python for, for this webinar. And I'm interfacing classic Python with C Sharp. And it's, it's a bit clunky. So Python is not the first choice in an enterprise application domain. Uh, the first choice would be Java or C Sharp. Um, so you're going to have some difficulty there if you create uh, machine learning components in enterprise apps. OK, now um, the support, the Python support in Visual Studio is pretty awesome. Um, I, I make a point of using free software for all my webinars. So I'm using Visual Studio Community Edition, so the free version. And it has a nice installer. And if you go in there and you enable Python development, then it installs um, yeah, basically a complete Python environment within Visual Studio. And you can just start coding Python right away. Now, so this is a screenshot of how I installed my uh, environment. And you can see on the right, um, there's an extra checkbox at the bottom. I selected Anaconda 3. So I did that because um, Anaconda is a very popular Python interpreter used in data sciences because it comes bundled with a lot of mathematical libraries that you're going to need out of the box to create machine learning applications. So um, like Anaconda is basically the go-to platform for machine learning. So as you can see, it's, it's supported in Visual Studio. So you can just check it. Uh, it will install a complete Python environment in your Visual Studio uh, IDE, and you can get started. So you have this beautiful Python support straight from Visual Studio. Now, if you take a close look at this screenshot at the top, you can see it says Windows 10, and it is a little Apple menu bar. So this is uh, visual proof that I'm doing everything on a MacBook Pro. Um, I'm running Parallels as my virtualization software, and then I'm, I'm I'm running a Windows 10 uh, guest session um, within my virtualization software. So everything runs in Windows 10, but it's all virtual. 
So hopefully one day I'll have enough money to buy a uh, PowerBook 2, uh, sorry, a Surface Book 2, um, and then I'll have an actual Windows machine to play with. But for now, it's a Mac. Um, so here we go. So here's the challenge. What we're going to do is we are going to take handwritten digits and convert them to, uh, well, ASCII text, basically. So and in my app, um, I'm actually going to draw the digits by hand uh, you know, using my mouse. And then the neural network is going to translate them into um, an ASCII character. So this is OCR, optical character recognition, but then specifically for numbers. Um, so we're going to use a neural network for this. So this is basically what a neural network looks like. Um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. It's a bunch of nodes. So those, those are the circles in this diagram. And they're connected. So you can see the arrows connecting the nodes together. And um, a neural network, it has an input side and an output side. So the input side is on the left. And what we do, we present input data to the network. So these, these are called features. So features is just a fancy name for the input data that we feed into a neural network. And then every node is going to do linear regression on that data. So basically, every, every circle that you see in this, this, this picture is a linear regressor um, that does a very simple uh, linear mathematical operation on the input data and produces output data. And on the input, usually we, we provide a floating point number between 0 and 1. And the output will, again, be a number between 0 and 1. Or it can be higher for certain types of networks, but usually it's a floating point number between 0 and 1. So it's just a bunch of nodes uh, doing linear algebra on input data. Then at the end, we consolidate the data into a single node. So that's the L node on the right, and that is the output. So in this case, I don't know, this could be a neural network that predicts the temperature in Barcelona at this time of the year. So the output node would be a floating point number between 0 and 100, and it would be the temperature in Celsius. And the input could be, could be anything like weather patterns, uh, could be, uh, um, I don't know, where the, where the Earth is in respect to the sun, with respect to the sun. We can put any kind of input data into the network, and it will produce output data. So we're going to use a neural network to perform handwriting recognition. And this is what it looks like. So we are going to present handwritten characters to the neural network. So to, to, to make this manageable, we're going to um, resize the characters to an image of 28 by 28 pixels. So you can see the pixels are drawn in blue and red. Um, you can see this is the number two. Right? So it's clearly a handwritten two in red on a blue background. So these are just a bunch of pixels. It's 784 pixels. And we're just going to feed them into the network one by one. So the input side of the neural network has 784 input features. Um, and we're just going to provide the pixels to the network one by one. So the pixel values, those are going to be uh, numbers between 0 and 255. Um, so this is basically you know, a monochrome image. Uh, 0 is black and 255 is white. We're going to do a tiny bit of pre-processing. We're going to scale that range down to 0 to 1. And we're going to flip it. So 0 is going to be white and 1 is black. So the input image, this image, all the blue pixels would be zero, and the red pixels would be, well, a value close to one, basically. I mean, it's a floating point number, so it could be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, you know, a, a value high up on the scale close to one. Then we're going to create two hidden layers in the neural network. So these are two hidden layers, uh, the middle two columns in the image, uh, with 100 nodes. So the input has 784 nodes, one for each pixel. And then we have two layers, each with 100 nodes, that perform linear algebra on these input values. And this is already a pretty advanced network. Um, you might be surprised that having these, these 200 nodes in two layers, um, they just do very simple uh, linear algebra on input data, that you can do anything with that. But this is already sufficient to create a, uh, an app that can recognize handwriting with a 90% accuracy. 90%. So it's pretty amazing. So you can do a lot of cool stuff with even tiny neural networks. Um, and then on the output side, so that's the, mo the rightmost column in this diagram, we will have 10 nodes. So we'll have 10 output nodes. And each node corresponds to a digit. 
So the first one corresponds to a zero, the second one to a one, the third one to a two, and so on and so on, all the way up to nine. And these nodes, they will output, again, a number between zero and one, and we're going to interpret this as a probability. So each node is going to tell us what the probability is that the handwritten digit is the number corresponding to that node. So in this example, the input is a two, um, and on the output, the L1 node, um, it's probably going to output something like um, 3% or 5%, you know, like uh, 0 0.05. So it's basically saying, well, it could be a zero, but I'm only 5% confident that it's a zero. Now, the, the L2 node is going to be a bit more optimistic because a two kind of looks like a one if you draw it slanted. So it might say uh, 0.38. So it's 38% confident that it's a one. And of course, the L3 node corresponds to the number two. So that node is going to output a very high probability. It's going to say, hey, when this is like 0.96, I'm 96% confident that I'm looking at a two. And so on, all the way up to L10. So when we feed a handwritten number into this neural network, the only thing we need to do is to look at the output nodes and take the nodes with the highest probability. And that will be the prediction that the network is making. So if the L3 node has the highest, the highest output value, then we say that the model, the neural network, predicts that the output is a number two. So the, the model predicts that the input, sorry, is a two. So that's how you interpret the output layer of a neural network. It's all probabilities, and we just take the highest value. So when we train a neural network, we just show it a whole bunch of images, and we tell it what the output is supposed to be. Because for every image, we know what the, the, the actual digit is. So the network can then calibrate its internal configuration so that its predictions closer and closer match what the actual values are supposed to be. That's how you train a neural network. So in the end, you get this soup of uh, about a thousand nodes with all kinds of interconnections between them and different kinds of weights on those interconnections. That's basically the configuration of the neural network. And um, it, it will be able to predict handwritten characters. OK, so that is uh, all the theory I have. So let's move on to the code. So here is my uh, project, my Visual Studio uh, projects. It's basically a solution with three projects. I'm going to show you um, three different uh, projects. I've got the handwriting trainer, which trains a neural net. I've got a handwriting predictor, which um, uses a pre-trained neural network to make predictions. And I have an app called the handwriting tester, which um, I can scribble by hand. I can scribble numbers, and it will try to predict what I'm, what I'm writing down. So I'll start with the trainer. So for the trainer, we're going to train a neural network, and we're going to need training data. So I, I can quickly show you what that training data looks like. Um, give me a sec. So this is a sample of um, the training data that I'm going to feed in the network. So I have a file with these images, basically. So these are different kinds of handwritten uh, numbers. I've got 5,000 of these um, images that I'm going to use for training. And each image has been tagged with the number, which it is, you know, the, the, the real number that has been drawn. So the network can train on these 5,000 digits, and it, it can learn how to recognize numbers. And it's not trivial. I mean, look at this one right here. I mean, it's labeled as a four, but it could easily be a nine because it's slanted and the top looks like a circle. So we're not sure what that is, actually. If you look at this one, this is a five, but I mean, does it look like a five? It's pretty sloppily drawn. How about this one? So this is a seven, but it could easily be a one. So these, these digits, they come from a classic data set called the MNIST data set. Uh, the full data set has 60,000 digits, but um, if I use TensorFlow to train that, it's going to take a week. Um, so I'm, I'm going to concentrate on a 5,000-digit subset. Um, you can see they're quite complicated. They, we're really going to stress this neural network to recognize really sloppily drawn digits. I mean, look at this one. I mean, is this a seven? Looks more like half of a zero, basically. It could be a nine also, you know. So, um, we, we're going to have some challenges here. So, um, and don't underestimate the challenge that this neural network has to uh, overcome in recognizing these digits. 
OK, so let's take a look at the code. So I'm in Visual Studio, and you're looking at Python code. Um, so it, this is basically a Python console project that I've created. And to get started, so I'm using a number of libraries. I'm using Pandas, which is fantastic for um, manipulating data sets. Um, the, the corresponding library in C-sharp is called Deedle. Uh, so if you saw my previous webinar, I, I showed you a lot of Deedle code. Pandas is the Deedle for Python. Um, I also, I'm using NumPy, which is a mathematical library, has some cool mathematical uh, functions. Here's TensorFlow, right here. Um, and I'm using this one, matplotlib, which is a fantastic plotting library. You can just in a few lines of code, you can create complicated plots of data. OK, so um, to start, uh, let me show you this function right here. So this is a function that outputs a function. So I'm, I need this because TensorFlow processes data with an input function. So basically, every time when you do something with TensorFlow, you have to provide it with a function. And that function is responsible for loading the data and presenting it to TensorFlow in the right format. Um, so basically, it's, uh, I don't think we have enough time for me to go deeply into detail uh, what this code does. Um, if you um, uh, enroll in my course, then there's a bunch of exercises that will take you through this function, and uh, you'll, you'll learn exactly how it works. But in a nutshell, really quick, um, you need to present data to TensorFlow as a data set. So I'm using this fun function here called dataset dot from tensor slices, and it creates a data set to, to you know to be presented to TensorFlow, and it builds it out of the features. So remember, this is the input of the neural network, and the targets, and the targets are the um, desired output of the neural network. So the targets are we we sometimes call this the ground truth. It's the um, the reality that we want the model to accurately predict. So in this case, uh, the targets would be the actual digits, and the features would be the pixels of those digits. And then we use the model, and it makes a prediction, and then we can compare the prediction to the targets. So um, this function creates an input function that we can use for training. Um, and it's, basically, it loads data into TensorFlow. So I've got another function down here, which does the same thing for predictions. So once we've We've trained the whoops. Once we've trained the um, neural network, we can use that trained neural network to to do predictions, and we need a separate input function for that. So that's that's this thing. This thing creates the input function to do predictions. Okay, so here's the meat of the uh, application. So the first thing I do is I load the MNIST dataset. It's a subset. You know, I've got this medium uh, suffix. So it's only 5,000 uh, digits from the data set. So I'm loading it into a uh, pandas um, data set. And then here I'm, I'm, I'm printing the number of rows that have been loaded. And then here I do a little trick. I'm partitioning the data. So you always have to do this in machine learning. You train your neural network on one set of data, and then you test it on another set. And so usually what we do is we take the first 80% of our data set, and we train the neural network on that data. And then we take the last 20%, and we call that the validation partition. And we uh, validate the network on, on that data set. So Pandas has this really cool function called lock. Um, and it has two arguments. The first argument is a, is a row range. And the second argument is a column range. So you can basically you can take a data set, and you can slice it in two dimensions. You can slice it in rows, which I'm doing here. And then here down here, you can see I'm slicing it on columns. So I can create different slices of my data sets and use them for different things. So in this case, this is simply slicing on rows. So the first 80% goes into training, and the last 20% goes into validation. Then the next step is I have to extract the features. Now remember, this is the input, the pixels, and the labels. Now, labels is another word for targets, which is another word for ground truth which means the reality that we want to uh, have our predictions match. Now, to understand this code, let me show you the input file. So I've got the input file right here. Now look at this. So this is the uh, uh, file that I'm loading into uh, my Python app. It's a CSV file. And you can see the first column right here. This is the label. So this is the digit, 6, 5, 7, 9, 5, 2. Uh, it's the ground truth, the reality. 
All the remaining columns are pixel values. So you can see zero is the background. And then here, the numbers go up, and this would be a fairly dark pixel. See, there's 254, that's almost black. So these are pixel values. And it's basically the uh, handwritten character, so the image, um, and just row by row. So the first row, the second row, the third row, all the way to the bottom row of, of the image. So it's just pixel data. So remember that. The first column is the label, and the remaining columns are the features, the pixels. So in my code, I can use this beautiful lock function again, and I can say the labels are all rows and then column zero, the first column, and the features are all rows and columns one to 784. And this just works. It slices the pandas data set uh, in, uh, in columns and creates these two, uh, well, series collections, basically, one with the labels and one with the features, the pixels. And then finally here, you can see I, I divide the pixel values by 255 so that I get a nice range from zero to one. So again, the, the beauty of Python, you can just take this, this Panda series and um, perform mathematical operations on it as if it is a, a floating point number. And it will just, it will perform that operation on every value in the series. So this is all for the training set. Remember the first 80% of the file. So I'm gonna do it again for the validation. Uh, set. So this is the exact same code, but for validation. And then here, um, I'm going to grab a random character from the training file, and I'm going to plot it. So here you have matplotlib, and it has this beautiful function called matshow, which can display a matrix on, on screen as a plot. Um, so basically, the only thing I do is I take my features, um, I index the row by this, this random uh, location that I just calculated, I take the values, so it's going to be an array of 784 floating point numbers, and then I have this function called reshape, and it is, it's going to reshape this array into a 28 by 28 matrix. And then that matrix I can feed into matshow, and it will just plot it. So let's run that and see what happens. Uh, let me check if, yeah, it's, it's my active project. So let me just run it. So this code is going to just grab a random um, row from the 5,000 uh, digit uh, training file and plot it on the screen. So this is a little test to see if everything is working correctly. So I'm running the Zoom uh, conferencing software while I'm talking. So you can see my computer is a bit slower than normal. So it takes a while for Python to start up. You can see here it's Anaconda 364 um, in the Visual Studio shared library. And here you go, see it's an eight. So this is the number eight, just randomly plucked from the data set. You can see here it says label eight. So the ground truth is eight and it is an eight. Um, so everything looks fine. So my, my Python code is correctly loading data. So let's continue. So the next step is I'm gonna have to tell TensorFlow what the input data looks like. I have to create a feature column descriptor. So you, you usually use functions in the tf.feature column uh, namespace for that. Um, the input feature is a numeric column. I mean, it's, it's a column containing floating point numbers from zero to one. And the nice thing about TensorFlow is I can, I can just add this parameter here, shape, where I can say, okay, it is a numeric column, but there's 784 of them. So instead of having to create this numeric column 784 times, I'm gonna just say, no, there's one column, but its shape is 784, so it has 784 um, elements in it. Um, so now the neural network knows that it will receive 784 uh, pixel values as input. So the next step is I create my training functions. So I'm, I'm calling this, this function that I just showed you, create training fn and create predict fn, and this will set up the input functions for TensorFlow. So I will be using them later. Then here, I'm creating my uh, neural network. So what I'm building is a DNN classifier, DNN, deep neural network. And it's a classifier because it outputs probabilities. If it would output um, like a, a floating point number, like a range, you know, temperature or average age, we would call that a regressor. Um, but a classifier, um, a classifier basically says, um, the output, you know, it, it can be one of a set of classes and it will output probabilities. So it's to say 10% that it might be this class, 50% that it might be this class, and so on. 
So in this example, uh, I mean, we're feeding it an image and we are predicting if it's the number zero to nine. So we have 10 classes and 10 probabilities. So it's a classifier. So this is how you set up a neural network in TensorFlow. Uh, you specify the classifier and then you feed it the feature column descriptor. You have to provide the number of output classes. So uh, how many nodes do we have on our output side of the neural network? 10 nodes, one for each digit. We have to specify the number of hidden layers. They call that hidden units. So I'm specifying two hidden layers of 100 nodes each. You have to specify an optimizer. I'll get to that in a minute. And I've got this model directory here. So this is really cool. When I train the neural network, it will automatically save its state into this folder. So later, I can reload the neural network uh, by specifying the same folder. It will load pre-trained. So I can use that later to do predictions. Here's the optimizer. I'm using, whoops, sorry. Here's the optimizer. I'm using an optimizer called Gradient Descent Optimizer. This is an algorithm that will train a neural network so that its output closer and closer and closer matches the labels, the ground truth. So it's basically an algorithm that just starts tweaking weights inside the neural network to get better and better results. And um, there is this, this hyperparameter called learning rate right here. And this is the, basically the step size. So basically the interval uh, with which the optimizer increases or decreases weights in the neural network. So if you, if you specify a really high learning rate, then you run the risk that the optimizer is going to bounce around the optimal solution. It will never converge. And if you make the learning rate too small, then it's going to take forever to train the, the network. So there is this magic value where you can very quickly train a network to get good results. And there's no, no rule for finding the optimal learning rate. It's, um, it's guesswork, basically. So you have to experiment, 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 and find the optimal value. I did that. The optimal value is 0 0.05. So now you know. OK, so moving on. Um, we have the neural network. It's all set up. So next step is we can actually train it. So to train a neural net, this is all you need to do. You call the train function. You provide the input function that uh, I just set up. And you have to specify a number of steps. So a number of steps is how many times the network will be trained before it exits the train function. So you can see I'm, I'm running this whole thing 10 times. I have this loop here. And I am in each loop iteration, I'm training 50 times. So this, this network will be trained 500 times. And um, every 50 training steps, I can, I can show some output. So here, this is basically where I show the output. What this code does is it uses the partially trained neural network to perform predictions. So you can see here, it says model.predict. So I'm, I'm performing predictions. Um, I'm storing these predictions in this, this object here. Um, I called it a probability set, but this is basically an object that contains a number of uh, neural net outputs. And there's, there's two variables that we can extract from this set. One is the probabilities array. So this is the, the 10 percentages of what the number might be. And the other is the class IDs. Now, class ID is just the prediction. So for every handwritten digit, then the model is going to predict what the number is. Um, I'm doing this. I'm doing this on training and on validation because I want to calculate something called log loss. Now, log loss is um, it's a number that indicates how far the neural net predictions are deviating from the ground truth. So a log loss of zero is perfect because then it means the neural net is exactly predicting the ground truth. It's always right. And a very high log loss is not good because that means the network has no idea what it's doing and it's just predicting wrong data all the time. So by calculating this within the training loop, um, I, can, I can print how the uh, neural net is slowly converging, how it's getting smarter and smarter. And I can even store these values in an array and plot them later. So if I scroll down a bit here, I'm using matplotlib to plot how the training log loss and the validation log loss is improving over time. So um, um, we get a nice graph. I'll show you the graph in a minute. And the final thing that I can do is I can use, uh, once I've exited the training loop, that's here, up here, I can use the trained neural network to do a set of predictions. And then I can calculate something called the accuracy. 
it's right here, accuracy score. Accuracy is a, it's a very um, uh, popular metric to uh, evaluate neural networks. It, is, uh, it indicates how often the network predicts correct results. So if I have 5,000 digits, and um, the network predicts 4,000 of them correctly and 1,000 are incorrectly predicted, then the accuracy would be 80%. So it, it's a nice metric that tells us how, how well-trained the neural network is. Of course, if the accuracy is 100, then the model is perfect and it can, it can predict, it can make accurate predictions in all scenarios. You're never gonna see that in practice, but it's, it's the, the uh, ideal value that we're striving for. So um, I can plot the, uh, the log loss, how it's improving over time. And finally, I can calculate something called the confusion matrix and plot the confusion matrix as well. Now, I'll, I'll show you the confusion matrix in a minute because it's easier to explain what it is if you see it in front of you. So if I run this training code, So now it's, um, you can see it's, it's starting Anaconda again, it's running the Python interpreter. Um, it's my, uh, in a second my code is going to load, then it's going to load the data file, it's gonna set up the neural network, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We so we're probably still gonna see the random image. So I see, here we go, here's the image, so let me close this. See, now the code continues. So now it's setting up the neural network and the optimizer, and in a second it's gonna start the training loop. Now, setting up the neural network, you can see it takes some time. TensorFlow is a bit slow in initialization. Um, so yeah, basically, it's now creating these two hidden layers of 100 nodes each and so on. So here we go. Now it's training. So now the thing is, this whole training loop takes about, I think, 10, 15 minutes on my computer. So it's not very fast. Um, I don't, we're not going to wait 15 minutes before we see a result. I even get a warning here that my CPU supports um, advanced mathematical instructions that TensorFlow is not using, so it's, it's even slower. Um, so I know if we were to wait a few minutes, you'd see the first result, but I'm just gonna abort this and show you a, a screenshot of the final result. So here is the, uh, oops, here is the result. Let me see if I can scale that a bit for you. There we go. So the um, so here the neural network is being trained. Now look at these these numbers here. Uh, this set of numbers. So this is the log loss on the training and on the validation sets over these ten periods. You can see at the end the log loss for training is zero. So it's pretty awesome. Eh? I'm, I'm training this network on four thousand handwritten digits, and it can perfectly predict every single digit in the end. So fantastic. But if you look at the validation log loss, it's 3.8. So that means the, the network is perfectly trained on training data, but it still has trouble with the validation data. And this is why we always separate the two, because um, if we train a neural network on all of our data, then it will start to um, train on random noise. It will start to, um, it will think that random noise is significant and it will use random input data to, to make predictions to perfectly match the training data. And in practice, of course, this is not gonna work because if I show different images to the neural network, the noise will be different and the network will get completely confused. So this, there's a name for this, it happens a lot. It's called overfitting. Um, and it means that the network is, is perfectly attuned to the training data, but it does a terrible job on the validation data. So to be able to detect overfitting, we always have these two sets, training and validation. So in the end, my final log loss is zero on training, which is it's okay. I mean, the network can perfectly predict the training digits, but it's 3.8 on validation, and that corresponds to an accuracy of 0.89, so 89%. So um, it will correctly predict about um, 4,500 uh, digits, roughly, and it will struggle with 500 out of a set of 5,000. It's not bad. It's not bad. And uh, keep in mind, this is only 5,000 digits that I'm training on, and I'm only using 500 training iterations. If you want to do a really good job, you should train for 2,000 steps, 2,000 iterations, um, and you should use the full data file and not just the first 5,000. 
So this is the, um, the output of the uh, program. Um, let me show you something else. This is the, yeah, here we go. So this is the training curve. So you can see that the training log loss is, it starts out at around five and it ends at zero. So this is, you can see that the network is getting smarter and smarter. It gets better and better at predicting all the digits. But the validation log loss, it also goes down, but um, there's this big gap between the two. Now, this is normal. You will always see um, a very good training log loss, a very low value in the end, and a much higher validation log loss. It's not, no problem. The only thing that's important is that the two lines keep going down. Um, as soon as you start overfitting, you'll see that the um, training loss loss will keep dropping, but the validation one will actually go up. Once you see that, that orange line go up, it means that you're overfitting and you need to stop um, because your model is no longer going to make useful predictions. Now here on the right, this is the confusion matrix. So it's, it's a very nice matrix. It shows the, the reality, the ground truth here vertically and the predictions horizontally. And in shades of black, it shows how well the network is doing. So you can see that the diagonal is pretty dark, pretty, it's almost black, which means that we have lots and lots of predictions that are completely accurate. But these little gray cells here and there, these are the incorrect predictions. So you can see that the number four um, is very often incorrectly predicted as a nine. You can see this is a, um, I mean, relatively dark shade of gray. So this happens a lot. And here is another cell with a fairly dark grayish color. So that means a nine is also often mischaracterized as a four the other way around. So that's quite funny. So um, for a perfectly trained uh, neural network, you would expect this diagonal line to be black and everything else to be white. Now you're never gonna see that. There's always gonna be a few errors, but we want to minimize the errors as much as possible. So th this is called the confusion matrix, and it's a fantastic tool to evaluate the performance of a um, neural net classifier. So if I had continued my application, if I had run it uh, until completion, then this would be the output. Okay, so let's continue um, to um, looking at the code. So this is the training code. Um, I also have a, a Python application called a predictor. So it's right here, this one. And the predictor, it's basically, it's the exact same code. So Again, we have this create predict function, which creates the input function to do predictions with a neural net. Um, it loads the data, it loads a file called input.csv right here, and then it extracts features using the validation set, and then it, um, it will show the digit so that we know for sure that it's a correct number. Um, it sets up the feature descriptor, it sets up the input function for TensorFlow, it initializes the neural network. It's the exact same code. Um, you can see the model directory is here again. So here's the trick. Because I specified this model directory, um, this network loads pre-trained. So it, it loads, it initializes, and it has all the knowledge of the fully trained neural network. So I can start using it right away. I don't have to train it. So I'm predicting um, the, I'm using the, the neural network to do a prediction, and I'm specifying the input function here. Then I'm extracting the class ID. So this is the prediction of the neural network and I'm printing it, that's it. So let's run this thing and see what happens. Um, I have this little test file here called input test four, which is the number four. Um, I'll also set verbose to true, so you can see the output number. And I'm just gonna run this. So it's going to use the fully trained neural network to um, parse an input file of the number four and attempt to predict what the number is. So let's wait a few seconds for this thing to, uh, to load. Here we go. So it's obviously a four, so that's okay. Uh, so let me continue. So now it's initializing the neural network and it's loading um, the configuration data from the model directory. So it's, it's, it'll be pre-trained from the get-go. Boom, boom, boom. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Initialization takes a while. It's TensorFlow. It's a bit slow starting up. Now it's analyzing the image. It's doing the prediction. And you can see the prediction is four. So um, it works. The neural net is able to recognize handwritten digits. So this is awesome. 
So finally, um, I have a third application that I want to show you. Uh, wait, first I need to put this back to false, and I need to put this back, otherwise the third app is not going to work. Like that. So I'm going to show you a third application, and this is um, it's it's a C sharp application that I built, and um, it's it's kind of cute actually. It's it looks like this. So it has this canvas here on the left, and this is just a canvas where I can draw shapes with my mouse. And then here on the right, it has a list box, and it can show a prediction. So what this app does is it it lets me scribble a number, and then it will call the Python application. So it will just launch the process. It will launch the Anaconda Python interpreter. It will load my Python file. It will feed it my uh, my scribble, and then it will basically run this 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 thing, this predictor app that you just saw. So it will capture standard input, so we can see the output in this list box, and then it will tell us the prediction. So the code is pretty simple. Um, the code, um, there's some simple code down here where I've, you know, I've, I've captured a couple of events, uh, like the mouse up event, um, the mouse move event here, um, and the mouse down event. I'm using that to draw on a picture box. Um, and then when I when I uh, when I detect a mouse up event, um, so basically I'm letting go of the mouse button. Then here in this this function predict digits, it will draw the uh, the scribble, the doodle. Um, it will draw it using a graphics object onto a bitmap. It will resize the bitmap to 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, this one's important. It's going to blur the bitmap. This is important. If you want to boost the efficiency of your neural network, blurring the input data works really well. So it's going to blur the, the scribble. Um, it's going to extract the pixel data. So you can see it's a simple link query that just loops through the image and uses get pixel to grab the pixel data. I can see I, I, do, I have this little expression here, 255 minus image.getPixel. So this basically, uh, it flips the range so that uh, uh, the uh, white background is zero and black is 255. So it flips the color range around. So then I take these pixels and I write them to disk as a CSV file. And you can see I'm writing them in the Python project directory. So I'm, I'm creating this input.csv file. Um, and then basically it's gonna call Python. So I'm using the process classes and process start info to basically launch the Anaconda uh, Python interpreter. Then I am providing it with my Python file, so the, the file you just saw. Um, I'm setting the working directory, and then I just run it. So this is C Sharp um, calling a Python console application and redirecting standard output. So I'm basically I'm redirecting the output so that I can grab this prediction at the end and display it. Um, and that's it. And then, so basically, the Python application, it, it has all this output. The last line of the output is the prediction. So this, this code, it really, it, it looks at the list box, and it just grabs the last item in the list box, which is the prediction, and it copies it into a label. So we can, we can see the prediction in a, in a nice big font. So let me run that. So again, this C-sharp application is going to call the Python app that I just showed you. Uh, so it's, it's the exact same code. So um, here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw. Um, I'll start with a four. So let me draw a four like this. That. Now I'm letting go of the mouse and it's calling the Python app. So now it's it's calling the Anaconda Python interpreter. It's loading my Python predictor application. It's running it, and we can we can see in the list box what the output is going to be. So you can see there's a delay because it's um, uh, it shows the output at the end. It's buffering. So it's, it's initializing TensorFlow now. And uh, while it's doing that, we can't see the output. So here we go. So you can see it's the same output. Yeah? It's just loading input data, accepting features. We, we, we just saw that when I ran the Python code. And here's the prediction at the end, a four, which is correct. So awesome. Let's try a different number. I'll do a three. Yes, this is a three. <laughs> it's pretty hard to draw with the mouse, uh, with the trackpad. So again, calling Python, initializing TensorFlow, yada, yada, wait for it. And it thinks it's an eight. So this is a mistake, this is wrong, but you can see where it's coming from. Eh? The neural network has been trained 
to recognize two circles on top of each other as an eight. So what it's looking at now is an incomplete eight. There's a piece missing on the, le on the left, but there are enough neurons firing on this shape that it still predicts it's an eight. And if we had outputted the class probabilities, uh, we probably would have seen that the prediction for three is also pretty high. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if say, the neural network is now saying it's 60% confident that it's looking at a three and 70% confident it's looking at an eight. So um, it's, it's just, um, it's picking the wrong class, basically. But again, we only trained it for, for uh, 5,000 digits. So let me try a six. Yeah. If you think about it, it's really cool. Eh? I'm, I'm drawing numbers. Um, they're just images, basically. And I have this, this very simple neural network, just two hidden layers of 100 nodes. And it's accurately predicting the, uh, the numbers. Well, semi-accurately, it's, it's working hard. <laughs> so you can see again that this is wrong. But again, you can see where it's coming from. Eh? The uh, five has a circle at the bottom and then this, this uh, L-shaped thing at the top. So um, a six kind of looks like a five. So there are enough structural elements in a six to make this neural network think it's looking at a five. So let's do something simple, a one. So I played around with this app in advance and I knew that uh, it works best on a four. So that's why I started with a four. Um, and it, it's also important how I draw the numbers. They have to be centered, um, they have to be straight up, um, and um, they have to kind of match the drawing style of this 5000 test set that I used. But this is completely wrong, eh? like an eight um, uh, instead of a one. So let's, let's, let's do a one with a bit more features like that. So maybe that works a bit better. So the, the challenge with this MNIST data set is to get the accuracy as high as possible. Um, I got up to 96% with uh, C Sharp code with uh, Accord.net. Um, TensorFlow um, is able to, to uh, produce almost perfect results on this data set, but you have to do a full training. You have to train it on all 60,000 uh, digits, and you really need 2,000 training iterations. Um, in fact, there are AI teams all over the world, and they are constantly trying to get better and better scores on this data set. The, one of the best performing um, projects right now um, uses a neural net with three hidden layers. So not two layers of 100, but three of 100. So you need a pretty powerful computer to train that kind of neural network. Um, but it, it's not that more complicated than what we're using right here. It's just one extra layer. So, okay, one more. I'll do a zero. See how that goes. So you can see, I said that um, Python is difficult for um, enterprise level applications, and you can see why. Huh? Um, I have to, yay, correct prediction, zero. So, I mean, I have to call an executable from the command line to run my predictions. Uh, because Python and .NET are not talking to each other at all. So um, I have to create this information conduit where they talk to each other, and it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, between you and me, in practice, if you need this in a production environment, and you use Python, don't do it like this. Um, create a Python server that just starts up and then listens on a network socket, and then do some kind of messaging protocol where the .NET software submits a request on a network socket, Python, the Python server picks it up, it performs a prediction, it puts its answer on a return message, and C Sharp picks up the return message. So basically a service-oriented architecture. You can get a really good performance if you work that way. And in fact, in 2016, I had a gig in Silicon Valley, and we did it exactly like this. Uh, we had a virtual machine running Python, and running a neural network in Python, and it communicated with C Sharp through a network socket. Um, but of course, I had to hack this together uh, for this webinar, so I used a console interface instead. Okay, so let me stop this. Um, so that uh, was all the code in this webinar. Um, I'm going to put the code online, and you can uh, access it from my website once I've put everything online. So if you want to play around with this code in Visual Studio, 
um, just go to my website, mdfargo.com, and download this source code, literally the source code I just sh showed you. Um, I'll add all my training files as well, so you can just use it right away out of the box. Um, and uh, yeah, play around with Python and TensorFlow. So moving back to <coughs> moving back to my presentation, um, the this exercise. So basically, it came from a course that I completed a few days ago. So this uh, course that I created a few days ago. Um, so this um, course is all about an introduction to machine learning. So it covers linear regression, uh, logistic regression, feature engineering, regular regularizing, difficult words, regularizing, um, uh, uh, regularizing machine learning models, and creating deep neural networks. And so this exercise is literally in the course. Um, so there's a lot of theory so that you learn the background. There's a lot of uh, Python examples, so you can get familiar with the, with the language and with TensorFlow, with the TensorFlow API. And then it literally contains this exercise. So you can go through the exercise and play around with handwriting recognition. So if you're interested, um, it's on my website, on mdfarago.com. Um, so the course, the URL is machine learning TensorFlow. So you can just you know, copy that URL and go to that website. Um, and it's, it's forty-seven dollars. So that's uh, I mean I have to pay my rent, of course. Uh, so um, I can't give it away for free. But I think forty-seven forty-seven is pretty cheap. So if you're interested, um, go there and check out the course. Um, if you're interested in the other stuff that I have online, um, then um, you can take a subscription. I've got this thing called a VIP membership subscription. Um, it's twenty-seven dollars per month, and then you get full access to everything I've ever produced. So I have like fourteen courses online now, um, and you can access all of them. Um, I'm producing new courses at a rate of about one per month, and they're they're all included. So if you're a VIP member, anything I will ever produce, you get included in that membership. So that's pretty cool if you want to really dig deep into C sharp into uh, Becoming an awesome solution architect, I've got a course for that. If you want to become an awesome CTO, I've got a course for that. If you want to optimize your C-sharp code, I've got a course. And I've got this course, but then in C-sharp, not in Python. So you can do machine learning in C-sharp or in Python, in TensorFlow, whatever you want. So check out the VIP membership, because I think it's pretty cool. So again, ndfiber.com uh, slash training slash machine learning TensorFlow. Machine learning TensorFlow, very simple. Um, and that is it. So that brings us to the end of the uh, webinar. So um, if you want to contact me, this is uh, some places where you can reach me. So my email address is at the bottom. Um, I, basically, my name is MD Farragher everywhere. Um, so if you go to Facebook, MD Farragher, that's me. On Twitter, MD Farragher. On LinkedIn, MD Farragher. Uh, you, you always reach me. There's one Facebook group, which is really cool, called C Sharp Architects. Um, so this is a Facebook group uh, for C# -sharp developers and people in leadership positions around the C# -sharp and .net uh, domain. Um, so if you're interested in um, hanging out with fellow developers or solution architects or lead devs or you know people in the C# -sharp and .net domain, I invite you to join the group. So um, I, I post my updates in that group, and they occasionally we post uh, cool C# -sharp stuff like. 7.2 C sharp 7.2 features uh, performance tweaks that kind of stuff. So it's it's a very nice Facebook group. So you're all invited. Um, yeah, and that brings me to the end of this webinar. So again, the webinar is recorded. So uh, if you missed the part, you can uh, watch the recording online. Um, and now, um, so I went slightly over an hour, but let's spend a few minutes um, covering questions. So I'm looking at this, the chat window right now. If you have a question, type it in the chat right now so I can see it. Um, so I see two questions. I'll start with the last one. Will this training be available on Udemy? Uh, the answer is no. And the reason is uh, I love Udemy. It's a beautiful platform. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with Udemy but they discount everything to $10. Now, I think that's cool. Um, I used Udemy to launch my online training career, and I'll, I'll always be grateful to them. But uh, there are some courses that I want to sell for slightly more than $10, like $47, and I can only do that on my website. So if I put this training on Udemy, 
then I'm basically undercutting the price uh, because um, you could basically just get it for 10 and there would be no point in selling it for 47 anymore. So my, my rule for now is that all machine learning and computer vision trainings go on my site and they don't go on Udemy. And everything else is on Udemy. So if you're interested in uh, C-sharp leadership, CTO development, uh, you know, leadership development skills, C-sharp performance, multi-threading, uh, C-sharp advanced features, that's all on Udemy. But all the machine learning stuff and computer vision stuff is on my side. Um, for now, I might change that in the future, but for now, that's my policy. And so again, the other question, can you provide some C-sharp to Python engine, as you mentioned? So I'm not quite sure what you mean with that question. Um, I think what you're referring to is the interface between C-sharp and Python. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, type something in the, in the chat if I'm wrong. Yeah, awesome. So, yeah, so um, it is an issue. Right? I mean, you saw how slow TensorFlow is starting up. Um, so if you launch um, a neural network in Python from the command line, which is basically the go-to solution, then you're going to have this delay every time. Um, so I would advise you to definitely wrap it up in a service. You could still do a command line application as a service. Um, so you just create a Python console application and have it listen on a network socket. So it basically becomes a server. Um, and that way, I think that's probably the most efficient way to uh, communicate with Python. You could also do it in a virtual machine. So you basically, the whole thing is a black box and you only have this single network socket that you expose from the virtual machine. Um, but yeah, so in an enterprise environment, uh, this could be a bottleneck. Um, if you do it as a service, of course, you can, um, you, you can scale out. Huh? You can have this single Python service um, running the neural network and then you just instantiate uh, 50 of them or 100 and then you use some kind of load balancing algorithm to um, to send requests to the Python instance that has the lowest workload. So you could do something like that. That would work beautifully well in, a, in an enterprise environment and you could set that up in Azure in the cloud. So um, it's very compatible with .NET. Um, uh, you saw that uh, Visual Studio has Python support out of the box. So Python is uh, it's turning into a first-class language for Azure. Um, so um, you can basically use Python in enterprise environments, uh, but be careful that you create the correct um, interface. My go-to solution actually would be some kind of message queue. Um, I would use a standard message queue library, something with broad industry support, and then you know, find some Python code that can consume the queue and some C-sharp code that can submit messages to that queue and then just hook them together like that. Uh, message queues are awesome in hooking up two uh, distinct systems together in an enterprise environment with good performance metrics. Really, they're awesome. So yeah, my answer would be see if you can set up some kind of message queue. Um, I, I don't think that's a standard solution. I haven't seen it yet, but you can easily code it yourself. Okay, next question. Um, what is the recommended hardware to run machine learning? So the recommended hardware is lots of GPUs. <laughs> um, so um, TensorFlow um, really needs a GPU to shine, to run, uh, to run fast. So you need a computer with a really good graphics card. So I mentioned the um, Surface Book 2 earlier. Um, I, I mean, I love that computer and I really want to buy it. Um, and I love it because it has an NVIDIA 1050 graphics card built in. Um, that is one beast of a GPU in there, uh, which is perfect for machine learning. So that would be a very nice environment. Um, any graphics card, the bigger the better, and multiple graphics, graphics cards uh, are also very nice. Um, you can also do it on a Mac. Um, Apple has recently added support for multiple graphics cards to um, OS X. So you can basically connect, uh, you can use a Firewire cable to connect um, external GPUs to a Mac, and then you can use those for machine learning. So the more GPUs, the better. Um, basically, uh, for mere mortals, you know, if, um, uh, if, if people like you and me who can't afford you know, like really advanced computers at home, um, another way to do it is to simply upload stuff to the cloud. Um, again, Azure supports TensorFlow, so you, you can uh, instantiate uh, TensorFlow in your Azure subscription, and then you can simply take a model, you can take the data, upload it to the cloud, have the cloud do all the training, and then pull the train model down again into your computer. 
And I think that's going to be the go-to solution in the future. Both Microsoft and Google are investing heavily in new processors uh, that are basically just loads and loads and loads of GPUs on a single guy. Um, and they are creating these, these Azure, Azure cloud servers and they just have racks and racks and racks of GPUs. So the idea is that you take your, your data, you put it in the cloud, and then you basically tell Azure, train a TensorFlow model on this data and then pipe the model directly back down to me so I have the trained model on my computer. Um, CNTK also supports that, the Cognitive Toolkit. So Microsoft really believes in this model um, that people will use the cloud for training and use their local devices for uh, consuming, for doing predictions. And I, I believe them. I think that's going to be the future. Uh, but if you want to do it yourself, um, get a nice, get, get a gaming laptop, basically. Get a laptop that can run a game uh, or that can run virtual reality uh, nicely. So get a laptop uh, or a computer that is supported by, uh, you know, the, the Rift or the Vive, uh, the VR headsets, because they will have uh, awesome GPUs that can run, um, that can, can uh, run machine learning. So next question, would the new Intel Movidius chip help? Uh, probably, but I'm, I'm not familiar with that chip. So <laughs> I'm going to Google it after this, this webinar and check it out. Um, basically, you're going to need support for that chip in your um, machine learning library. So it would probably help, but the libraries need to specifically support that hardware. So you need to look that up. Um, the, the machine learning libraries, they support every GPU out of the box. So if you have a GPU, it'll just work and it'll be, it'll be faster. Um, Intel Movidius, maybe. I'm not sure if that is supported. So you have to do some research. But I would expect that it would help, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've been going for one hour and 15 minutes. So we're slightly uh, over schedule. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'll do one more question. So and it just came in. Um, so here, somebody says, I'm totally new to AI. Sola says, I'm totally new to AI and machine learning. What's your recommendation and where to start? Um, well, you know, humbly asking me, uh, my humble response would be, check out my course. Uh, because the course is an introduction to machine learning. So it's incredibly simple. It's, uh, I start out with linear regression, um, which is basically fitting a straight line through a bunch of data points. And then I build up on that um, slowly until I conclude with neural networks. Um, and it's a fantastic step-by-step uh, -step guide to, if you have like zero knowledge of machine learning, to get up to the point where you can confidently create small, deep neural networks and use them for uh, simple machine learning scenarios. And I'm going to add more and more courses. Huh? So this is a beginner course that I created. Um, and... Uh, I will create more advanced courses with, uh, you know, where we're going to do really cool stuff, like uh, maybe parsing audio where I talk into a computer and it transcribes it into text. Maybe build a little digital assistant, a Siri kind of tool where we can have a conversation with a, with a piece of software. So I'm going to look for cool examples that do this really groundbreaking stuff in machine learning, turn them into courses and publish them on my site. So uh, my second piece of advice would be keep an eye on my site and see which courses pop up. And I can take you from absolute beginner level to expert level, no problem. I just need a few months to create the, uh, <laughs> the, the extra courses. Okay, um, so that's basically it. So another question came in, is this course on Udemy? So I already answered that. Uh, no, it's not, and it will not appear on Udemy. It will only be on my website. Uh, so you have to go to mdfiber.com to uh, enroll in the course. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thanks everyone for listening and thank you for your awesome questions. So uh, it was a lot of fun doing, doing this webinar. I'm going to do a webinar every time when I create a new course. So I create courses monthly. So the next webinar will be in a month or so. So uh, watch your inbox. Um, I'm going to put the recording online uh, on Facebook and on my website. So uh, keep an eye on that too, if you want to watch the video uh, offline and take a closer look at my code. And keep an eye on my site because I'll put a link there where you can request the source code. Um, so you can download the complete solution and put it in Visual Studio and play around with it on your own system and really get up to speed with Python and TensorFlow. So 
that's it, basically. So thanks, everyone. Uh, it was awesome giving this webinar for you. Um, really happy. I'm happy with your questions. I had a lot of fun. I hope you had a lot of fun, too, listening. And I hope to see you. I, obviously, I hope to see you in my beautiful new course. But I also hope to see you at my next webinar in one month's time. And if you're not in the Facebook group yet, please enroll. Um, because um, that's where all the cool stuff happens in Facebook, in the C -sharp group. All right, everyone. Thank you. And see you next time.